So I guess I have the task of keeping you from falling asleep after lunch. So I will make this thrilling and exciting. So here's an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I just want to walk you through the multi-hazard mitigation process a little bit, give you an overview of it, tell you about my experience with it at Polis, and then we can talk about future enhancements. So that sounds exciting, right? <laughs> Okay, here's the background. Congress observed that, you know, surprisingly, they're paying more money for hazards. So in the 80s, you know, they, they paid the laughable amount of almost $4 billion. So they got a little concerned when in the 90s that number jumped up to $25.4 billion. And then Hurricane Katrina. So now they realized, okay, we need to do something about this. So they passed the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000. This act requires every county in the United States to develop and maintain a multi plan. The mitigation plan needs to have a risk assessment and it needs to have mitigation strategies. They also developed a GIS tool called Hazus MH to help communities do this. Has anybody heard of Hazus? Okay, a couple. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. So at the Polis Center, we're an applied research center, but we have started to focus on multi-hazard mitigation planning since about 2002 or so. We've done some planning efforts in Wisconsin and Minnesota at a statewide scale, but we've really focused on Indiana and Illinois lately. So we've done 72 of the 92 counties in Indiana. And we've done approximately 30 so far in Illinois, but we're continuing to get grants to complete more projects. The planning process can be broken down into four pretty distinct phases. First phase, organize resources. Second phase, identify your hazards and then do a risk assessment. Third phase, create some mitigation strategies and really pull this plan together. And then finally, adopt it and implement it. So when organizing resources, it's essential that we get the local community stakeholders involved in the process. They have the best data, they have the best information. So they're, they're kind of the core of the planning team. They also provide us with GIS and assessor data, which helps to feed hazards. Um, the more data we have, the better output we can get. We collect the essential facilities data. This includes schools, fire stations, police stations, emergency operation centers, and um, care facilities, hospitals, nursing homes, things like that. They can also do uh, what we call critical facilities, which are more user-defined, and it kind of goes from county to county. And then we research historical hazards. So we look at old newspapers, we look at um, the National Climatic Data Center, and old county plans. Phase two is the risk assessment. So we'll talk a little bit about Hazus MH. It's a GIS-based tool. You can go on FEMA's website, download it for free on your computer at home, and run hazards in your living room. Uh, it uses GIS technology and it estimates physical losses, economic, and social impacts of potential disasters. So how does it estimate these losses? Well, in this first step, it's analyzing the physical landscape. So it's assessing hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. Those are the capabilities of it currently. And then it identifies a hazard. So a community may say, I want to run a 5.5 magnitude earthquake, and I want it to happen in the middle of my community. I just want to see what happens. And they can do that. Then it considers what is at risk. What kind of inventory is in that community that's at risk, and what kind of infrastructure would be potentially damaged? The social and economic impacts would include, you know, what, it's more than just buildings. What would happen if businesses shut down for a month? What would that do to my community? 
what about shelter requirements? What about special populations? What if I've got four nursing homes in my county? So it really, it takes all of that into consideration. And then it provides an output so they can put that into their plan. So in one of the first meetings, we ask the communities to identify the hazards that are specific to them. Um, anybody here from Lake County? Okay, good. Everything is severe in Lake County, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we, we say, we'd like you to consider tornadoes, flooding, earthquakes, droughts, thunderstorms, and winter storms as your natural hazards. We'd also like you to consider what happens if there's a hazardous material spill? What happens if there's a fire? What about a dam and levee failure? And then we say, okay, so now you've got the hazards. What's the probability that this hazard's gonna occur? How likely is it? You know, it, Lake County's probably not gonna have an earthquake. Maybe, we had that earthquake in Chicago, but probably not their biggest threat. Flooding though, yeah, they're gonna have it twice a year, every year. And then, how impactful will that hazard be if it happens? You know, if maybe it's a kind of a low probability that you're gonna have an earthquake, but if you're in southern Indiana, that could be incredibly detrimental. So we multiply those together and we come up with a hazard risk. Then we have to profile and analyze these hazards. So as I said before, hazards can do earthquakes, hurricanes, we don't do many of those in Indiana, and uh, flooding. But there are some other software programs out there that can do more. So here we're looking at um, Aloha, which is an EPA software that models chemical spills, hazmat spills. And this is the output that we get. We've got a map that shows which types of facilities. Here we see the 100-year flood boundary. And we see which types of facilities are in that boundary that are going to be damaged. And then we've got a table that says, OK, you're going to have 240 residential homes. And because we put your local county data in there, we're estimating it's going to be about $37 million. So what do we do about it? In phase three, we know what the hazards are. We have an idea of what the damages would be. But what are we going to do about it? We don't want to wait for it to happen, so we have to come up with some strategies to mitigate that. So these are FEMA's guidelines, and we go through and brainstorm a list, like a, a wish list. These are some examples. Um, a strategy might be, let's convert some of these you know, repetitive loss areas to wetlands. Or let's reconnect some floodplains. It can also be, let's harden the fire station, because we're concerned about a tornado coming through. So there's a whole list of different types of strategies you can come up with. Finally, you have to get the plan approved because FEMA's not gonna give any kind of federal dollars unless they approve your plan. So they came up with this crosswalk that the community can go through, check off everything that they have in the plan, and then make sure it's gonna get approved. Then they adopt it, they implement it, and they can start writing grants. There's a lot that can still be done with mitigation planning. One goal is that you know, communities don't think about droughts very much. They really don't. You go to a community and you say, well, what's your probability of having a drought? And they say, eh, we haven't had one since 1995. You know, we're, we're not that worried. Well, what, what would the impact be? I don't know. Tell people not to water their lawns as much. You know, they just don't think about it. So we need a lot more public education. We need to get them to think about climate change. We need to get them to understand that it's not a question of will it happen, it's when. So, 
you know, this is, this is something that is a difficult challenge that we're currently trying to work through. Yes, you can analyze a drought, obviously. Most of you have already been doing that. But can we analyze a drought in the same way that has us as analyzing a flood? You know, what are the economic impacts? What are the vulnerabilities to a community? What, they don't want to hear science. You know, they want to hear, well, my livestock is going to be at risk. It's going to cost me this much money. So how do we do that? We haven't started to do it yet, but we're starting to think about this. So our initial thoughts would be that first you have to define that boundary. So what is the drought boundary? Second, we have to calculate direct crop losses. So we'll have to do some additional research. It's going to be unique to each community, but that goes into the second step. Thirdly, it wouldn't be HAZUS, but we need to come up with a HAZUS-like GIS and use that to estimate these indirect losses, to perform a risk assessment and come up with some outputs. And then finally, we have to think of other impacts that would be related to that drought. So get the community to think about fire protection and, you know, what's going to happen to their critical infrastructure? What's going to happen to their businesses? What's going to happen to their farms? That's what they need to think about. Second goal, they need to think about floodplains. You know, there's, there's a direct correlation there. And we, <laughs> we have one emergency manager that we worked with who actually built his home in a floodplain <laughs> <laughs> and was not sure why we said, you need to have better zoning. <laughs> so again, it's public education. It's explaining to them why it's important to reconnect floodplains and what the benefits are to their community when those floodplains are existing and are healthy. I always get the comment when we do the mitigation strategies, well, what's the point of this? FEMA doesn't give us any money. You know, we, never, we never get any money. Submit grants and they won't pay us. Well, yes they will. <laughs> you know, this is a priority for FEMA. And if they can't pay all of it, they will help you work with state agencies to come up with money. So now's the time to start applying for this kind of stuff and to really enhance your mitigation plans so that they work for your community. There you go. Exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Thank uh, you. Any questions for Nora? Uh, uh, <laughs> the step approach that you mentioned, is that similar to the drought ready communities and is that what it has some uh, similarities? Um, I one of the things we try to talk about is just the, trying to develop such a module, if you will, for drought because FEMA doesn't Right. The requirement is they want pre pre disaster mitigation knowledge. They still have to show this within the hazard mitigation plan. Right. So it's sort of a catch twenty two there for them. They still need to do that. So um, that's that's an issue. I mean, we, we work with a lot of groups that are like not necessarily with the full center, although very much in the energy game for power. But that's a real challenge that we're going forward. But those steps are very reasonable. Um, and they're very adjustable so too. Okay. But for those producers that insure their crops, if it's multi parallel you don't know if hail caused it or, you know, right. falls in a multi -parallel. Um So that's a problem, but there is a database there for, for hazards uh, for risk management agencies. And the other thing I would caution is that your business and community, what we found, we worked with in the drought ready community project was, we went to them and said, well, we're okay, we've got 15 wells, uh, we'll never go dry. Uh, right. And just reservoir, this river. But then we said, okay, let's say the drought hits the uh, hits the agricultural community around your around your city center, where it's the non irrigated area. Let's say, like most of Indiana, Illinois, et cetera, where you don't have a lot of irrigation. And they said they weren't really thinking of, okay, if the farmers don't have money, don't come into town and spend the money at the stores. <laughs> you 
you know, they, yeah. there's that domino effect that they weren't really thinking. And then they step back and we're starting to think big picture landscaping, tourism, all these things that you don't have in some of these models that we need to think about for drought. Because drought is really cross sectional. Well, I think you made two really good points. One is that if it's not in their mitigation plan as a strategy, they won't get funding for it. So that's why when we have these brainstorming sessions, we try to get them to think of absolutely everything they can come up with. You know, to because they only update the plans every five years or so. Um, the other thing is that you're right; it's not a hot topic with FEMA right now. Flooding is everything's about flooding. So if we can develop some sort of a model that will show these impacts, you know, much more tangibly, then I think that may change some of the funding opportunities. Absolutely. Some things we can learn from you and, and take from that to use. Let us know what works and doesn't work. The, the worksheet for guided, meant to guide the communities through the process of thinking of those things you just touched on too. So maybe there's ways we can make those part of your, your center. Here. Oh, I think I think that would be a great connection. Are you just working in the state, or is it a regional focus? Or? No, we're working. We're doing local plans. Here, we're doing them in Illinois. We're doing them in. Um, we're doing some hurricane analyses in Texas. And then we are preparing to do the Indiana State Plan. So that'll be an interesting process. It would be nice if we could say if a D4 hits Peoria, what's going to happen? You know, we yeah. thought of all those scenarios. Yeah, no, I, think, I think it's important. Case scenario, that won't happen, but yeah, it can happen. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, go ahead. Laura, you might mention that the Polo Center, I believe, was one of the a key training facility for him. Yes, we do. Um, we're one of the key training facilities in the nation um, for HAZA software. So we teach everything from basic HAZAS to the more advanced courses, um, and we develop curriculum for FEMA for HAZAS uh, across the nation. So if anyone is interested in HAZAS courses, uh, please feel free to contact me, and I can definitely get you in touch with our training centers. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the 100-year uh, flood maps are built into hazards? Correct. So like that, you know, perhaps some information from ERI net from the droughts uh, would be useful, could be incorporated? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So perhaps yeah. there's something for us to think about. You know. Well, we used, we used HAZUS as a basis to develop a GIS analysis for tornadoes. And I think we can do the same thing for droughts. There's no reason we can't. We just need to you know, do the res use your research and figure out what the damage curves are, what the boundary is, and then just apply new algorithms. Do they not do anything in their HMGP funds either? Not, not to my knowledge. Okay. Not I knew they didn't in the PDM funds, they but. Well, as far as the pre mitigation dollars, like if they put these in the full time hazard plans now, right. that can allow for pre disaster, you know, sure. you need to put a second well in because they don't have a point resource of water, or second source right. of water, or, you know, some infrastructure type stuff, but not everything holistically to deal with drought. Mm -hmm. 
FEMA develops it. FEMA has a team, well, typically they use a CDS team to develop it, and they put out a new version every six months. So they're constantly tweaking it, they're constantly updating it. They just released HAZIS 2.0, which is a pretty significant change from the um, software just six months ago. And um, yeah, it's, it's constantly being tweaked. So I noticed that they would say, you know, this release, we have a new component. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think they get a lot of information from the cadre of instructors that they have across the nation and the feedback from the students who are taking the classes because, I mean, the students can be anyone from, you know, Joe off the street to the state schmo. So I think they take a lot of that into account, but a lot of it is internal and there's definitely room for improvement. That's why I think the the solution is less HAZIS and more developing a unique GIS that is HAZIS-like. Absolutely. That yeah, but that would be a great resource. That would be very helpful, yes. Yeah, I'd like to see it go kind of the way that we've done the tornado, where you can run a historical event, but you can also run a hypothetical. Because I think that just holds a lot more clout to communities. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes. You don't have one. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is finally about you know the people. Yes. I mean, in, the, uh, in the county, in the state, what have you. Now, uh, we can safely say that the floods and tornadoes are understood better than drought. We could say that, right? Uh, uh, because the impacts are immediate and so forth. But the droughts require education uh, mm -hmm. of you know, the farmers uh, primarily, because they are the people who are going to see their crops now. So, do you have any programs like educating the farmers? That is something that we intend to start incorporating into our plans. Obviously, I, I think the key to that is getting them to understand that their climate is changing oh. without saying climate change. Because <laughs> some of them hear that and it's like, la, la, la. You know, so, <laughs> so we have to be creative with how we reach out, especially to these rural communities. And you know, we just have to, we have to come up with data to show them, to prove to them climates are changing, your winters are colder, your summers are hotter. And if you have a hazard event, it's going to be a lot worse than when you've had it before. Thank you, Laura. We, we finally got to <laughs>